All right, everybody, thanks for uh, coming to our second session of the day. We'll have uh, uh, sessions in the next two days as well. My name is Jerry Day. If you have any questions about the AFCI, come see me. Otherwise, uh, these folks will be talking. I'll hand it over to the Master of Ceremonies, Joe Bessicini. Okay, thank you. Yay, Joe Bessicini! Yay! Okay, so here we are back here again, another year. And uh, we all know what an important part, um, I thought these people were already asking questions. It's like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> what an important role that uh, incentives play in filmmaking today. And uh, right now, um, could change at any time. There are currently 38 states that offer production incentives and probably more than 25 or 30 countries that offer incentives. Uh, for those of you that that don't receive our newsletter. Casting Crew publishes a bi-weekly newsletter that's devoted solely to, I realize I've got my back on these guys here now, that was, uh, is devoted solely to incentives. And uh, it covers uh, this topical uh, articles in there as well as uh, we track the, the legislation as it's introduced, as it moves through the House and the Senate and uh, hopefully, well, not in all cases, but the enactment of the legislation. So if you're not on that email list, uh, you can stop by our booth at uh, number 222 for cast and crew and just drop your business card in there and we'll put you on that list. Uh, just to get you up to speed a little bit, uh, since maybe just changes since the fall of 2014, uh, California amended their program. They're now going to award $330 million if you were here for Amy's. Um, panel, you, you learned all about that. They still have 100 million that's uh, under the old program. Uh, Croatia has changed their sunset date from 2020 to December 30, 31st, 2019. France increased their per project tax credit uh, from 10 million euros to 20 million euros. That's uh, annual. The Germany established a funding cap of 50 million euros uh, for the calendar year 2015. Hungary increased the rebate percentage from 20 to 25 percent. Michigan streamlined their program. Uh, now they award 25 to percent on residents, non-residents, uh, and all qualifying spend. They also removed the $2 million salary cap that they had on their program. And, uh, they now, the way that they cap it is um, they limit the above the line uh, credit to be no more than 30% of the total credit that the project earns. And Nevada uh, changed their funding cap. They had $20 million per calendar year. They now only have, because of the deal that was given to uh, Tesla batteries, uh, they're only gonna have $10 million to use through 2017. Uh, so there, there is a bill introduced to, to get that back online, we'll, and we'll talk about that in a second. North Carolina's uh, tax credit program ended at the end of 2014, and it was replaced by a rebate program of 25%. They currently have uh, $10 million of funding, and they have a $5 million per project rebate cap. Uh, and they're working on uh, trying to get some more money into that program. Nova Scotia extended the sunset date through December 31st, 2020. South Africa modified its tax rebate program to establish a per project rebate cap of 50 million rand. That's about 4.3 million US dollars. And they reduced their post-production only rebate percentage from 25% to 20%. And then lastly, uh, South Korea established a funding cap of uh, one billion one, which is uh, approximately one million dollars, and that's for the calendar year 2015. As far as uh, current legislation that's out there, uh, Alaska has a bill out there to eliminate three positions in the film office and to sunset their film program effective July 1st, 2015. Um, that looks like it has a lot of potential. Arizona um, had a program. There was a bill out there to reestablish their incentive program. It was sunset a couple of years ago. 
that bill uh, didn't make it out of committee. So that's dead. They're going to try to get something put in the uh, governor's budget, maybe, for Arizona. Indiana uh, has a House bill um, that proposes to reestablish the expired production incentive credit. Kentucky has a bill to uh, increase their refundable tax credit from 20% to 30% and higher. Uh, Maryland has a bill out there right now to establish a yearly cap of $25 million uh, for each of the 2017, 2018, and 2019 fiscal year. Uh, so that's an increase for them. And it also to extend the sunset date from uh, June 30th, 2016 to June 30th, 2019. And the last two, um, Minnesota, oh, I apologize, there's more. Minnesota uh, proposes to allocate $10 million for the 2016 fiscal year. Missouri is trying to reinstate their program. Nevada is proposed, they have a bill that proposes to get back to their 20 million per physical year uh, funding cap. Pennsylvania has a, a bill out there to eliminate the $60 million annual funding cap. And um, in Washington, they currently have a $3.5 million uh, per calendar year cap, and they have a bill out there that's going to increase that from uh, 3.5 million up to uh, 10 million uh, on a staggered basis from uh, 29 up to 2019. So that takes care of what's happened in the past and what's out there currently. It's a really busy legislative session season right now. There's bills coming in left and right. So if you uh, subscribe to the newsletter, you'll be up to date on all that stuff. Today on the panel, we have, uh, you know, AFCI is, stands for the Associated Film Commissioners International. And my panels in the past have been mainly domestic centric, if you will. And uh, so I thought that maybe this year we'd mix it up a little bit and bring some international folks up here. So we have Katie, who's the Executive Vice President of US Production for the British Film Commission. And then next to Katie is Nick. He's the director of the New, York, New Mexico Film Office. Not so foreign or international, but you know. Some people think we are. But Some people not. think you are. Um, and then Kate Marks is the executive vice president of international production for Oz Film. And then next to Kate is Ana Thomason. He's the film commissioner for Iceland. So I have a lot of questions. Uh, again, my experience here has been there's a lot of first time film makers here. I see some studio folks here who have more experience. But I thought we'd uh, you know, go through each program and try to, rather than jump around from the UK to New Mexico, kind of just focus on the UK first, and then we'll do New Mexico, and then Australia, and so you can kind of get a full picture of each uh, jurisdiction. So I'm going to start this off by saying I have a project that I'm thinking about bringing to one of four jurisdictions. <laughs> okay. And um, Katie, I'm wondering, can you just provide me with the brief overview of what the incentives are? Sure. I have a, my project happens to be a feature, but good to know. could be TV <laughs> good down to the know. road. Well, Joe, I would love for you to bring your project to the UK. <laughs> and a few of the reasons that I would love for you to bring your project to the UK are, it would enable you to see all of the UK potentially. A lot of people don't know exactly what nations the UK is comprised of. And so that's one of the first things that I talk about, that the UK is comprised of Northern Ireland, of Scotland, of England, and Wales. So as the British Film Commission, we actually look out for production and filmmaking, television, in all of those jurisdictions. And we work with the film commissions and screen agencies that are in all those nations. So we have an office on the ground here in the US. And when we meet with folks like Joe that have projects, we try and help evaluate where the film might fit best and then make connections for you to those people. But in terms of the incentive that is covered across the UK, 
um, on the film side of things, it's been in existence as it stands for a number of years. And the first step that you would need to evaluate and we could help you with is whether your film will pass the cultural test to qualify it as British in order to claim the tax relief. It sounds a bit ominous, but it's really not as ominous as it might sound. Um, the cultural test is really evaluating the project on a number of levels from content to where you plan to shoot to who's working on your project. And like many other European countries that you might be familiar with, you need to get a certain number of points to pass the test to qualify as British and claim the tax relief. Um, so it could be that maybe some of the content isn't as British or European specific, but you're planning to shoot in the UK and you have a number of European um, cast and crew on it, you can accrue points that way that will get you to kind of a passing grade. Uh, I won't so go, I I'm can go through I'm it in detail if you'd like, but... Well, let's save that. I'm Italian. Yeah. So do I get any points for being Italian in that cultural test? Because Italy and the in UK fact, are, are kind of In fact, you close. do. Uh, the, film, <laughs> the film cultural test has been expanded recently. And while it used to be just um, UK citizens or residents that counted toward points, it's now European EEA citizens huh? and residents, so um, it's more inclusive. Right. That, that is relevant to people working on the film as well as the content of the film. So you don't necessarily have to be doing um, a historical project about the monarchy. It could be something that's much more European, kind of global based that could qualify as well. Great. And then um, once you qualify in terms of, the, in terms of films, um, your film has to be intended for theatrical broadcast. And the, the basic tax relief is 25% on the on the ground spend in the UK. And the term that we use in the UK is used and consumed. So anything that you're doing on the ground in the UK counts toward um, the tax relief. Um, we can probably get so into So can you give it. us yeah, an yeah. example of used and consumed because that's something different than what, what Nick has in New Mexico. For sure, for sure. So um, some of the more kind of exceptional things that you might not think of in terms of used and consumed, I mean, it's going to be the obvious things of if you're shooting there and you're incurring costs on hotels or on stages, you know, all that kind of thing. But things that, that, come into, that come into play would be, let's say, you're doing a period piece and you are, because you're Italian, Joe, you decide that there are all these fantastic costume shops and designers in Italy, and so you want to hire your costumes out of Italy, but use them on your sets and so forth in the UK. The rental cost, even though, it's, even though you're paying a company in Italy, is going to be um, something that's going to qualify for tax relief because you're using the costumes on the ground in the UK. Interesting. Yeah? Can you just talk about, did you mention the, the percentages? Yeah, so the percentage on, on the film side of it, it's, um, there, there's a couple of things to keep in mind, um, kind of low, lower budget films and higher budget films. So there's, there's a bit of an um, area of 20 million pounds. If your film's budget is below 20 million pounds, then you're going to get 25% tax relief on all your on the ground spend in the UK. If your film it film's budget is above 20 million pounds, then you're going to get 25% on the first 20 million and then 20% on anything above that. I should mention that in terms of the overall tax relief that's available in the UK for films, there's no cap. So, you know, as many films that come and qualify via the cultural test and are shooting there, they will get the tax relief. There is a ceiling on the amount of tax relief that you can claim on a particular project. And this has to do with um, EU kind of competition rules. In, let's take Joe's project, for example. I'm going to assume your your budget is maybe around 10 million pounds or yeah, so? Yeah, 10, okay. 10, 12 okay. million. So your budget's <laughs> around 10 million pounds, let's say, and you really want to bring the entire production to the UK. 
well, you're only going to be incentivized on 80% of it. So on $8 million, you'll get the 25% the tax relief. But on the remaining 2 million pounds, you're not going to be incentivized at all. So it would actually behoove you to take that 2 million and spend it elsewhere. Somewhere because else. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And so um, I've heard also that uh, the UK, aside from the used and consumed, they have a couple of other unique uh, kind of concepts. And mm -hmm. one of those might be um, interim claims that you can make. Yeah. So maybe can you, can you talk about how that process works? Yep, yeah, for sure. I mean, one of the things that, that I would recommend in terms of bringing a project to the UK is to link up with savvy um, media production accountants over there. And one of the things that, that they can help with and help you look at is how you want to structure your accounting periods. Because in the UK, you can determine accounting periods for your project so you can help cash flow your project. So you could do an accounting period that covers pre-production, an accounting period that covers production, and one that covers post. So you can actually be claiming some of the tax relief along the way and not necessarily have to wait until the very end of your um, project to, to claim it all. And I should mention, you know, in saying that, that um, you're paid directly from government. So it's actually a pretty quick process in the grand scheme of things. Um, once you pass your cultural test and get your certification, um, then when you're putting in all your paperwork and making your claim, it's usually from about four to six weeks that then you'll get a check back from um, Her Majesty. And so um, I'm thinking that even though my, my project is $12 million, I'm going to make a ton of money on this show, mm -hmm. OK? Mm -hmm. And I heard something about, like, most of the people work cheaply for me, right? So I gave them back-end mm -hmm. profit participation mm -hmm. stuff. What can you tell me about that? Do the profit participations qualify? Or? They, yes, they do, um, which is something that's um, pretty special and uh, unique. The, the catch is that you do need to be to be running those through the film production company that you've set up in the UK. So you have to keep so that even, company yeah, open. Yeah, you have to keep that company open because you might be claiming those years down the line. It still needs to be run through that so that the UK government can kind of see all the costs that have been incurred. And that would be claimed on a cash basis? In other words, as you pay those claims, you would then submit, as you pay the, par, par, uh, the profit participation, you would then you would put the claim, submit the, the claim. Yeah. So you can't just estimate it up front like I'm going to pay these no. guys no, yeah. fifty they million to, dollars they need and put to that see in. Real, real figures. Okay, I I have a lot more questions for you, but I want to make sure I get along sure. to these guys here. Can I can I just uh, just sure. I just want to mention one more thing, and this might relate to to your film, Joe, um, because if your film's really successful, you might want to create a TV series. Yeah, that off would it. be yeah. off it. Yeah. So, kind of like Entourage or something. Yeah, exactly, like exactly. So the good thing to know is that in the UK, um, about two years ago, they actually passed a, film, a TV tax credit, tax relief program that's basically based on the film tax relief program. Because the film tax relief program was so successful, very user friendly. Um, and they saw that the opportunity would be there for television. So I won't go through the details, but it works in a quite similar way to the film tax relief and is there at about the 25% level as well. Um, so we're working now a lot with um, American producers and studios and execs on um, television shows um, coming over to the UK as well. Things like Game of Thrones and Outlander and Gallivant. Um, the new E! show, The Royals, shot in the UK last year, so. And what about the minimum spend requirement? There is, there is a minimum spend requirement on the TV side of it, and it's one million pounds per broadcast hour, which for the high-end scripted dramas isn't typically going to be a problem. It was really so that um, kind of the lower budget productions that were already shooting and would continue to stay in the UK wouldn't necessarily be um, incentivized, but the things that might be going elsewhere, both inherently indigenous UK um, TV production and US production, would, would have a bit more of a, an interest in coming. Okay. 
Well, I like what I hear, Katie, but uh, I'm gonna ask Nick what he's got to okay. offer there. <laughs> Nick, can you give me a little bit of an overview? Of well, the... Joe, <laughs> we too have a cultural test. <laughs> 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 it's very, it's very simple. You just have to know that New Mexico is in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> that is an easy test. It's an e well, you'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so we are. Uh, you're making a film, right? I'm making a film. Had you been making a television series. <laughs> You would have gotten 30% on all qualified spend. Uh, and, and film is 25%. In certain cases, if, you, if your budget's under 30 million, you spend 10 days on a sound stage. Um, the New Mexico resident crew portion of your production will get a bump to 30%. And if you're over 30 and you spend 15 days on a sound stage, the New Mexico resident crew portion will get a bump to 30%. So we're trying to incentivize you to use our studios and use our people. Um, we have a program called FCAP, Film Crew Advancement Program. So if you move someone from a third to a second, second to a first, we'll pay half their salary up to 1,040 hours. And that's to try and get our crew more experience and get you guys to move them up the ladder. Um, you can send us a script and we'll break it down and send you back photo packages of of what we, what we think would work. You could tell us you want it in the north, you want it in the south, and we'll, we'll uh, do it however you'd like, and then we, we get that off to you. We have no minimum spend, and we have no ceiling on the amount you can spend on your project. We do have a $50 million rolling cap, which means we can go over that $50 million in a year, but those that are over it will get paid in our, at the beginning of our next fiscal year. So everyone gets paid, it just happens if you're over the 50 million, uh, it'll, you'll get paid July 1, which is our next fiscal year. Um, we have and that's based on, can we just go through that for a second? So you finish your show and I finish my project in uh, November, and then I have to get it audited because, uh, well, you have a requirement that it has to be audited. What if it's over $5 million incentive? If the, if the, if the, pay, if the rebate's over $5 million, yes. Yeah, so in this case, I probably may not meet that threshold, but it still is going to be audited by tax and rev. Right. I'm going to submit my information to them. Right. They're going to audit it. That goes into the next uh, calendar year. So I submitted it in November. It's not until February of the following year that I hear back from them and I get some kind of, of a certificate saying that this is what I'm qualified for after going back and forth. When can I actually use that certificate? Do I use it in the year in November 2014 when I submitted it or do I use it in the 2015 year when I actually received it? That's a very good question. Um, you filed your taxes in, it, it's at the end, of, you have to file at the end of your taxable year. So if you filed in 2014 and they needed an extension, I think you would get it in 2014, but I want to, yeah, so you'd get it in 2014. But if you didn't file and you filed in 15, you'd have to wait till the end of that taxable year if you had any more expenses um, to, to get the rebate back. So it's at the end of your taxable year, you get the number, the approved amount, and if it's, it's, if it's under $2 million, you get a check sent to you. If it's between two and four, you get half of it today and half of it in 12 months. And if it's anything over five million, you get a third of it today, a third of it in 12 months, and a third of it in 24 months. And if we have cap space left over at the beginning of the year, we can pay, it's a first in, first out. Uh, we can pay down debt of the next year, of the following year. So if you haven't used the whole $50 million for this current year, and you have a project that was supposed to be paid out over two payments, you can accelerate that second payment Correct. into this current year and use up that 50 million. Correct. Does the balance of that, the, the leftover part of that 50 million get added on to the next year? So let's say you, you only gave out 40 million. Do yeah. you now have 60 million the next year we, or we, no? We had that provision for three years, but we, we never had enough to, to roll over because we had debt to pay. So we would just pay the so debt. you used it that way. But do you anticipate in the future as you build more uh, TV shows 
there that you'll be hitting that? Um, well, when we, when we, you know, the plan is to go to 99% rebate. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to put our cap to $329 million. <laughs> um, what was the question? <laughs> Get me out of here. The, the, the question is, are there any requirements I need to be aware of when I come to New Mexico? Do I just go out there and start filming? Do well, I have to let you know I'm there? No, we'd like you to let us know you're, you're there. There's an application that just says we're here and we plan on shooting in these dates, and so we know you're there. Then when you're in pre-production, when you have your accountants on the ground, we will come, a member of my, our staff will come, along with a member of, of Tax and Rev. They have a film unit. That's all they do. We come and we do a pre-production meeting with you, and we go through everything. So we tell you what to flag and what not to flag if you're shooting on an Indian reservation. The fees, uh, the location fees do not count because they're a sovereign nation, but everything else counts. So you have to think, New Mexico is, if it's taxable by the state, it probably qualifies. If it's not taxable by the state, it probably does not qualify. And we have a few limits, like on cars, I think it's $100 a day, but you, unless you're getting a Lamborghini, you would, that wouldn't matter. Hotels is $150 a day, and for most of your crew, you, you won't hit that. But if you have you know, your talent staying at a, a, at a pricey place, 150 of their you know, $1,000 room would count. And flights to and from New Mexico count if you book through a New Mexico travel agent, things like that. So um, are you saying that I, I don't have to worry about when I send my location crews there ahead of time? Even though I didn't really officially apply until later, those costs will qualify? They will qualify. Is there a time frame prior to that, like um, a month or six months before? If it's for the same project, I mean, if you crossed a taxable year, you'd have to file. You'd have to file. Now, you, now, Tax and Rev will let you hold that filing, though, and file together all at once if it crossed, let's say you crossed three taxable years. Um, but if you want your money up front, you would, you would, if you're crossing a taxable year, you would want to file because that then goes in the queue and you'd be able to recoup that, that rebate sooner. And then the next year you go through and then you file again. So for uh, studios, they may not be able to control um, their taxable year, right? They're probably filing in some kind of a combined return. Correct. Uh, you know, to do March 31st, they, March 15th, they get an extension, blah, blah, blah. But for independents um, who are maybe filming in the beginning of the year, January, February, and they're going to do their post, um, March, and they're going to be ready by April, let's say. They submit the, the information to Tax and Rev, um, and they get a result back from them by May, let's say, right? Um, Rather than wait until, let's say they, it wouldn't be wise for them to file when they organize their company as a calendar year company Correct. because now they've finished in April, they got their certificate, now they have to wait until the following May to attach that certificate to their, the following January to attach that certificate to their tax return. So they can, can you explain how they might? Well, so for productions, you know, all productions are usually an LLC, even the studios use LLCs. Um, you can set your company up however you want. So your taxable year, if you know you're going to shoot uh, January, February, March, and do some posts in April, and then give yourself a cushion of May or June, right? Then you make your taxable year, you make your, your year end in June. And so then you would file, and then June would be your end year, and then you'd get your money a, a lot quicker. You're right, so you wouldn't have to wait. Yeah. Are there any local incentives in New Mexico that you can uh, tag on? Ann Lerner will give you a back rub. She works in Albuquerque. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have no local incentives. The, it's come up, uh, but it, it, really I think Austin's the only, does someone know of another city that gives? Sarasota, Sarasota gives does? something, yeah. Jefferson Parish in Louisiana, there's a number of we them. We give you a bag of blue meth. <laughs> and it helps speed things along. <laughs> if you're behind schedule. If you give that to the tax and rev people. 
That would be really good. <laughs> Katie, I didn't ask you, do you have any local incentives that people can uh, add on? There are. Thanks for asking, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> In, in the various nations and regions, they all have different um, programs. Um, for example, in Wales, the Welsh government has a program um, particularly around if you go into alternative space and if you're looking to renovate some alternative space to use as stage space, they will um, come in and help fund that because it behooves them to then have more stage space um, down the line. Uh, Northern Ireland, for example, also has um, some incentives, um, production incentives, where they'll actually put funding into the project as well. And these are all on top of the you know, general UK tax relief program I talked about. So um, we, can, we usually direct people specifically to um, the contacts in the nations and regions that can get into all the specifics depending on what type of project it is and, and what you're interested in. So because the uh, gentleman from New Mexico yielded some time to you, I'm going to just go back to him again and ask a couple of questions. Thanks, so um, you know, the same way that the UK has some unique attributes in their program, New Mexico has some unique things going on there. Yeah, let's don't look like that, OK? Like what? <laughs> it's, it's like there's so, something called a labor pass-through and oh, a super okay. loan out company. OK. Can you maybe? Gives yeah. So, people some all right. So on the super loan out for for uh, cast, you can put we call it a super loan out. You can put all your cast into one loan out, and we have a limit of twenty million dollars. I Meaning you can get five million dollars back, uh, but there's a cap. So that cap's twenty million. So for your so let's just say for your me tiny for a little film. <laughs> <laughs> so so what qualifies in New Mexico uh, residents? Correct. Above the line, below the line, all residents and performing non-resident performing artists. Correct. As long as they go through this super loan out arrangement. Correct. correct. Now, with what is what I see as a loophole, which we're hoping to close this year, um, on non-resident crew, we have um, a deal where if we don't have crew available or if we don't have the skill set. You argue with me and or someone from my office that that's the case, and we go through the talk to the union. We make sure that the people aren't available. We'll allow you to bring in crew and get the rebate, but you have to go through a New Mexico company, and right now a like-minded company, a company that makes movies, and right now that would just be our studios. There are three that do it, and there may be two producers that can do it. Uh, but we have a law that, that's, that's moving right now in the Senate, and our plan is to um, take off above the line and PAs, right, so from keys down, basically. Um, we'll allow you, based on your size of your budget, to bring in a certain number of crew, and it'll be straight 15%. You don't have to pass it through anyone. That's cost you a couple, two, three, five percent, something like that. There's no gross receipts tax, which is another 7%. So it kind of is a wash. We might win by a point or two. Um, but but you, you can bring whoever you want, right? So you don't have to worry about whether they're there or not. Um, it's limited uh, by the size of your crew because what, what would happen to us, like we had Batman versus Superman come in for, for 10 days. They would have just brought their whole crew in. They wouldn't have hired any New Mexicans because they didn't have to, right? Um, so we limit. Uh, we limit it by the size of your crew. So, you know, the f first two million, you get four people. Then the next million, you get another person. And, uh, and then for pilots, we, I think we gave nine spots, just f free spots, because pilots are, you know, they happen really quickly, and, you, they, and studios don't usually know what pilot's going to get picked up or not. And, and so it's hard for them to hit the ground and, and grab a crew if we're busy. So we're gonna, we give them a, some extra spots. And then there's a little safety valve I, that we put in there. If, I, if there are five or more productions on the ground, I have the, the, uh, the right to, to give up to 10 more spots. And so with any luck, that bill will pass. It'll be simple. Well, it'll take away a lot of the work. And you know, it puts us at odds with the productions. I don't want to battle with the producer. Right. You know. right. so, so we think that'll be good. And, in our, and also in our new law, um, we're going to have uh, pilots, standalone pilots, be 30%. Right now, you, ha you can take the pilot and tack it on to five more episodes. 
because you have to have six episodes to get the 30%. Um, but if, you, if, the, if it doesn't go, it's 25%. So in this new law, standalone pilots will be 30%. Oh, good. And we love TV, and we love film. And games and apps, you can come and do that, make a game or an app, and the 25% for that as well. Well, these two programs sound great, but I gotta tell you, Kate, I'm looking at like 86.5% in Australia. I got 40% for a producer offset, PDV, I got 30, and location offset, 16. One Can or the I other. You can't huh? combine them. I can't, I can't combine all of those? No, you can't. But if your project was written by an Australian, um, you would want to look and see if you were eligible for our producer offset, which is for feature films, 40% of qualifying um, expenditure, which is all goods and services on the ground in Australia. This does have a cultural test. It's different to the British. Um, <laughs> it's not a point system. It's... Uh, this incentive is managed by uh, Screen Australia, which is our federal funding body, um, and it's a holistic test. They look at a number, they look at five elements um, of the project and determine whether or not it's in the balance of Australian. So they'll look at the content, the subject matter, the people making the film, and that's the writers, directors, producers, but also uh, key cast and key crew. Uh, they'll look at the amount of money being spent in Australia, and then they'll look at uh, any other uh, element that Screen Australia thinks is relevant, which, de which is sort of this random um, concoction of things which might be copyright, might be um, profit participation, but that just depends on the other four elements. So what you're really wanting to do is to partner with Australians um, in the development of a project to be eligible for that 40%. Uh, it's absolutely, um, it does work with American partners or, non, or international partners. We've had some large projects go through um, from the studios that have qualified for this incentive projects. Like a uh, good example is something like The Great Gatsby, um, obviously not an Australian story, uh, set in, in the US based on a US book but very much a project developed and created by Baz Luhrmann and he himself being Australian and the whole team behind that was Australian. So that project qualifies. So that's 40% for uh, feature films and 20% for television. Uh, if you're not working with Australians, there's two other options. We have our location offset, which is 16.5%. That does have a, a minimum spend of 15 million in Australia. Uh, but basically all goods and services, again, uh, uh, if you've got bringing in crew or cast, if they're in Australia for a minimum of two weeks on the ground, that does qualify. Um, we've also got one of the few standalone um, post and digital visual effects incentives at 30% with a minimum spend in Australia of only 500,000. So there's the three different options you can look at from a federal level. All our states do also offer their own incentive programs, uh, quite competitive, um, particularly between the East Coast being uh, Brisbane up the top with um, in Queensland, they've currently got Pirates in there with Disney, then you've got Sydney, New South Wales and Melbourne and Victoria. They're the, they're the states with the three major uh, stage facilities, sound stages, and then Adelaide as well and Western Australia and all those states do one-off grants negotiated um, directly with the production company, and as I say, can be quite competitive. So if you're looking at Australia, it's always good to look at, to have conversations with one or more states. Um, but Ausfilm itself, we are actually a membership organisation. Uh, we represent all the state and federal screen agencies and a number of our larger corporate uh, businesses in the visual effects and the uh, studios. So we can um, put you in contact with all the right people to speak to on the ground back in Australia. Does my Italian heritage get me anything in Australia? Uh, not, won't count for, for the producer offset, but your fees would count in Australia should you come down. Okay. <laughs> so, so you notice here, Kate didn't know any of the questions, Kate didn't know any of the questions I was asking, so I had a conversation, <laughs> then it went to Nick. Gets to Kate down here, she's already heard all the questions, right? She just <laughs> ramped, going through everything all at one time there. So let me ask you this, do you have to partner with a local production service company? All our incentive projects uh, have to go through an Australian company, but a, an American business can set up Australian company for the purpose of that project. If you are working under the producer offset, yes, you absolutely have to partner with an Australian producer. It is uh, the producer offset, that's what it's called, it's the Australian producer offset. 
So the Australian producer is, is the one responsible for applying and getting that grant um, and working with the offset. But for the PDV or the location offset, you can set up a, business, a company in Australia. And it's all our grants, they're checks, but they run through our tax system. So you file as part of our, as your um, tax return and you get a check from the government less any liabil tax liabilities that you may have um, under that company. And, and who gets that check? Is it the producer, the production service company, or the, the U.S. entity? It depends gets that which check? which incentive you're talking about. For the producer, say the off producer offset. The producer offset. The check will go to the Australian producer, who is the one actually applying and eligible to apply for that uh, okay. offset. How they do their deals with their partners, if they're partnering with an American company, is not our business, so that's that's part of their deal, but the money will actually go to the producer. The money for the PDV and the um, and the location offset will go to the, the company that applied, which could be an American company through their Australian business. And so this may be an obvious question, but you know, you're gonna get the money back in Australian dollars. Yes. Right? Um, and so, you know, from the time you started the production when you budgeted it until the time when you finally get this money back, there may be fluctuations in currency. You will uh -huh. be paid at the price at the, the price at the end. You get your final certificate and your qualifying expenditure. I mean, most companies would uh, lock in their currency at the start of production, and then that's how they would budget. But the check will be based on that that amount at the end. At the end. And is there an audit required? Uh, yes, all three incentives require an uh, audit process. Uh, so the producer offset, as I mentioned, is run by Screen Australia. So you provide them with an audit. They then assess uh, assess the spend and make sure that the project is, does, is still eligible for that one. For all our incentives, you can apply for a provisional at the start, which doesn't tell you that you're 100% guaranteed, but gives you an idea of what your quote could be. And assuming that you stick to the elements that you said in your application for that provisional, it's very likely that you're, um, you will get your final certificate. But it's not until you get the final certificate that you know that exactly what amount was um, what we call quape, uh, qualifying expenditure, and then what your rebate will be. So with the producer offset, you do that through Screen Australia. They run through an assessment process. I think they say they take around 12 weeks. Um, then you get your final certificate and then you lodge that with the tax office. And my understanding, what I've heard, is that's about four weeks to get the check with the other two offsets, that's directly with the ministry, um, with our government. And again, you submit your audit, they have an assessment process, and I think that's about the same 12 weeks, depending on what other projects they've got coming through. And again, then they send you a certificate and you lodge that with the tax department. Could you talk about um, co-production treaties a little bit and how they may benefit uh, producers? Sure. So Australia um, has, I think we've got about 10 co-production treaties um, around the world. We have them with our friends, the Brits. Um, mm -hmm. We have a number of European countries, uh, Germany, Italy, France. Uh, we're looking, we've got one, we've just signed with um, Korea. We have one with China, um, Canada, uh, basically a lot of countries other than the US. Um, unfortunately, mm -hmm. We always get asked, I mean, and I'm sure anyone who works in the co-production treaty space, um, why we don't have them with the US. But these treaties were actually designed um, and put in place around the world to help other markets compete with the US in terms of the industry. Um, so basically you have a, if you were to do a co-production with the UK, you have a producer, one from Australia, one from the UK. The project probably, the story of the project would have to, would most likely um, be relevant. So it might be, it might be have an Australian director and an Australian producer, but the story is written and set in the UK and you could look at um, doing, it's quite sort of technical, but you have a split. So it might be a 70% on the UK side and 30 in Australia. So you'd, you'd shoot the project in the UK and then you'd bring all your post-production back. And so the way they work is it's a financial and creative partnership, I guess. And the money that comes in from the finance side generally has to sort of equate to the money being spent in that territory. So if you're spending 70% of your money, there must be 70% from a creative side um, in terms of the team should be English and 70% of that money should be spent in the UK and then the same on the Australian side. So it's really a way of bringing in international financing and uh, working on a project that the story dependent and the creative side make it, make it happen and make sense to, um, it's hard to just sort of put one of these projects, sort of squeeze it into a box. It really needs to be organic and a natural fit to be done in two different countries. And you can do three 
um, three-way co-productions too, which just uh, gets a bit more complicated. So does this bypass the cultural test? Yes. Yeah. So one of the benefit for each side of these co-productions is that each national body will consider it a film of that nation. So for the UK, it would be a, a UK project and from their quotas and their incentives, they would be eligible without going through their point system, I would imagine. Yeah, and exactly. in Australia, the same. You wouldn't have to pass what we call the significant Australian content test, but you do have to go through quite a rigorous point system to actually be eligible for a co-production. So um, each, uh, each country whether in, their, um, in the treaty has their own guidelines and you have point systems that you have to actually go through to check that you are eligible for a co-production treaty status on your side. And our guidelines might be different to the UK guidelines, but it's the Australian producer's responsibility to work within our guidelines and the English producer's responsibility to work within their guidelines. And then somehow, hopefully, that all comes together. Well, Australia sounds good, but I'm a little disappointed. I thought I was going to get 86.5%. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's go over to um, Aner and see exactly what the program is. Can you tell us a little bit about the program in Iceland? It's smart of you to end with Iceland because I don't remember what they said. It's so complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, Iceland is small, Iceland is therefore efficient. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we have 20% uh, uh, repay, and uh, you have to go through a cultural test. 20%. Uh, and the cultural test is similar to what they have in the UK. And I think they never said no, yes. Uh, never, said, never said no uh, and to, to, to any project. And uh, <coughs> then you basically set up a SPV in Iceland for that project. You run all the costs through that uh, company. And when you finished, uh, you close down the company, uh, get the auditing uh, and, and the stamp, and you file it back to the ministry and they reimburse you. So it's quite simple, I would say. <laughs> so is, is there an application process at all? Uh, you apply before you start your production. That's important, you have to do that. And uh, if, you, if you send your, again, your location teams over there to do no, some scouting? No, you don't. You don't send them over there? No, we don't get them reimbursed. You don't get those to qualify? No. If you set up the company and applied previously? Yes, absolutely. Would they be there? So, absolutely. So you want to minimize your spend prior to getting the approval or prior to applying? And that's why they use the great production service companies in Iceland to do the scouting for them beforehand and, and get the pictures online. I see. And then they maybe set, send one scout up to, do, to verify everything. And then they simply come over and shoot. What is, the, uh, what is the cultural test there? Is it tough to pass that cultural test? Well, I would not say that. We've got Prometheus, Interstellar, uh, Oblivion. Uh, Iceland, the culture, oblivion, don't see the, how it works, but still, I mean, this is a creative industry. So uh, when you write the application, uh, you... <laughs> <laughs> so simple as this that. is where the creativity starts. <laughs> yes, Joe, I mean... Don't do that on our application. <laughs> and like for you, a, a guy like you, I mean, you're producing two big features a year, and we have many films in the pipeline. Uh, I'm glad to say that uh, the Minister of uh, Industry is with me here in, in, to, today, actually, sitting here in the crowd. Uh, and and uh, we have been here this week meeting with the studios. And uh, since we are so organized in, in Iceland, uh, we have decided that uh, in the government level that we're going to continue with the incentive system, even though it doesn't expire until uh, the end of 2016. So it will be uh, in, uh, until 2022. So that's good for a person like you to know that uh, you can be sure that you've been shooting in Iceland for the next seven years at least. And um, currently Iceland has a, an, an annual funding cap. Yeah. And so uh, my calculations say that it's about eight and a half million US dollars. Correct. How does that work? We had a conversation about, you know, if you had a project that was going to earn potentially more than that. Yeah. Can you explain how that works? 
<coughs> that's what the, uh, the, the yearly budget that the government has to approve uh, basically the year before. Uh, so it's based on the uh, experience that we have from that year. Uh, however, the government is able to, and what, that's what they do, they can put in an extra budget in, the, in October, November, every year. And so a project that is shooting, let's say, in September, they of course have to go through the process of wrapping up. So we are able to put in extra funding and pay them in the beginning of the next year. We have, so, we have, we have done it before and, and worked out perfectly. So you don't see the, the, the annual cap has not been a problem to date. There's never been a problem. <laughs> And then as far as the type of labor that qualifies there, do residents and non-residents qualify? Can I bring over my crew from the US and qualify that labor? No, only Icelandic labor. Only those who are uh, paying taxes in Iceland. And what kind of a crew base do you have there? Is, uh... We have a great crew. <laughs> Absolutely, I mean, uh, when you've been working with Clint Eastwood on Flags of Fathers, Ridley Scott on Prometheus, uh, Christopher Nolan on both Batman and Interstellar, and then Noah, uh, Star Trek, and I can on and on. Of course you have to have a skilled crew, and all these directors have stated in their uh, quotes that the crew in Iceland is at top notch. Are they unionized there in no. Iceland? That saves cost. We don't have unions for the film industry. So you'd be using much smaller crew in Iceland than uh, you're doing in the US, and actually, uh, and one of the big features, uh, one of the unit production managers was looking at the different departments and said, this is interesting. There's the same, there's a guy here in three different departments. They all have the exact same name. <laughs> <laughs> but being in an Iceland, like I said, it, you have to be able to do many things because of small, a small population. And that's what these guys do. They can both change the light bulb and even uh, serve your coffee. <laughs> <laughs> When, in order to submit the claim to the minister, did you say that it, there is an audit required? Uh, yeah, there's an audit required, of course. And it, it, that's done by a, um, an independent auditor, or is it actually done in the minister's office? No, by independent. Like independent? Price Holders, Coopers, KPMG, Ernst Young. KPMG. Guys. And so then, uh, once that's audited and you submit the, the claim to the minister of finance, yeah. um, do they then go through it again? Like, what's the time frame that you would expect to get the, the rebate back? It has been the best uh, results I remember was in, within the same month. And, but usually it's uh, no longer than three months. Like I say, we're small, we're efficient. <laughs> but I'm lucky that I'm not having these programs. I'm not smart enough. I would never remember it. <laughs> so I'm glad that my simple, with my simple system. So your program has been around since 2001, and it's continued to increase not only the annual fund, but the percentages that qualify. Correct. So it seems like you have a very good political support uh, for the program. We have 100% support in the with the politicians. So when it went through parliament, uh, all 63 members uh, agreed on it. So it doesn't matter if you're left or right, uh, they all support the, the industry. And I'm especially happy with the, the current uh, minister because she has uh, decided already that she's going to extend the, 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 the reimbursement system. So for us to be planning, and for you especially, planning all your features is very helpful. Do, do you have any local incentives in Iceland? No, this is only, only government uh, incentive. So there are no municipalities giving you, anything, giving you anything extra. What about sound stages there? Yeah, we have a good sound stage called Atlantic Studios. Uh, it's about 20,000 uh, square meters. It's on a former Navy base. It's operated by the US Army, close to the city, close to very good locations. So it can be used as a sound stage, a cover set, or even just as a base. And then we have a great post-production facilities as well. So if you want to do some of your post work in Iceland, you can do that and also get the incentives. And uh, for example, uh, for the frame store uh, from, 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 from UK, 
Uh, one of the key talents was Icelandic, and uh, for example, on gravity and, and, mm -hmm. and uh, Golden Compass, which both got Oscar. Uh, he decided that he wanted to raise his family in Iceland because it's a nice place. <laughs> And uh, because of its talent, uh, William, the founder, he decided to set up a shop in Iceland around him. And it's grown now from 2008, and uh, it's now about 40, 50 very wow. qualified people. And uh, as we speak, they're wrapping up the new Everest film uh, produced by Universal. So do the only new post in, in Iceland for that one. It's called now uh, REX, because it was management by it last year. So we are improving our infrastructure as well. So uh, to the panel as a whole, uh, um, is there any advice you would give um, a first-time producer going to your jurisdiction? Um, what, the, what would be really important to them? Either something that's, uh, you know, like read the regulations, read the rules, or something that's not even written, that, you know, you, you know something that you have just experience would be the only way that you know, have learned that. Yeah, I guess um, from my perspective, I would kind of say three things. I would say be in touch with us because we can do our best to put you in touch with other people that are going to be valuable in terms of your production. Um, the second I would say is if you think that you want to do your project in the UK to set up your SPV film production company as soon as possible. and incur your costs through that company because you want to be able to claim as many as possible and the sooner it's set up the sooner you know those are going to be on those books and then third I would say is um, you know think a bit about you know other films that have been done in the UK that might be similar in budget or in scope or what have you to your film and you know see if you can be in touch with that producer or people that were affiliated with that film um, or, you know, folks on the ground in the UK that were helping that film out because they're going to have the best advice to you in terms of similar things that, that you might come across. Nick, May, what about all the ice in Iceland? Is that a problem? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. If you want me to answer the question. Uh, I know it's green. It's, uh, it's actually, uh, it's many things. It's <laughs> both uh, black deserts and sulfur mountains, waterfalls and everything, and, and the dust is not troubling us at all. <laughs> <laughs> so in New Mexico, it's great to be in touch with us, but we also have 30, I think maybe 32 film liaisons in cities all across our state. And it, they're, they can be really helpful when you're, you know, I'll give you an example. Someone was shooting up in the Badlands near Farmington, and the, the uh, guard would not let them on. So we called our liaison, and she said, oh, my God, that's my cousin. I'll call him, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you get down further into the weeds, it's good to have people that know everyone in that, that area and can help you out. So we, we have this system set up of film liaisons that we train them. They have a three-day training that they do with us every year. Um, and so we're, we're pretty, pretty good at it. Um, again, it's talk to us um, as early as possible. Um, and then uh, once you've chosen your particular state, again, like Nick said, it's talking to the, the experts on the ground. And then we've got all our state film commissions um, and film officers are the experts. They've all got location managers that work in their areas. Um, and also then if you are wanting to work on a producer offset project, it's having uh, those conversations as early as possible in the development. So you're making sure that you are working with Australians um, from as early as possible. And again, we can help connect you to whether it's writers, directors or producers. And they are the three key people that will help you get that 40%. So it's, we know we don't want to see scripts that are fully written and ready to shoot looking for a director. That won't work if the script hasn't been written by an Australian. But if you've got a lot of work still to be done on a script or you happen to be working with an Australian, it's getting those conversations happening as early as possible. And your website, by the way, lists a tremendous amount of people from writers, directors, producers, cinematographers, location they managers. They get everyone on there. And then the states have that as well. Yeah. Well, you're all smart people. You know, time is money, so keep it simple. 
look at Iceland, and please visit my booth and, and get a Icelandic water. <laughs> <laughs> and information about our system. Uh, what is good about Iceland is, like I said, it's efficient. And everybody knows everybody. So if someone in the crew fucks up, everybody will know. And he will, <laughs> and, and that's why he would be put on site for a little while and cool down and get his skills back. So uh, what is also important is that everything is phone call away. So that means minimum red tapes. And I remember a story about a, a commercial director that woke up in the morning in the Hilton and had this splendid idea that he wanted to have eight cows on the set in the backdrop. So he went to the, to the set on location and uh, said, I would like to have eight cows on the set. Do you know anybody that has eight cows Delivered to you in five hours. <laughs> and then one guy said, I have a cousin living close by and uh, he has cows. Four hours later, they had eight cows on the set. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we, we, we said, use a kiss approach. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> and uh, things happen very fast in Iceland. And, and you know, even a big productions like Clint Eastwood, they usually finish the day before they expect it. And there's a very hard-working crew. And uh, they work six days a day, 12-hour day rate. And they are the top nuts you will get, <coughs> believe me. Well, I'd like to thank the panel today. I think they did a great job. <laughs> and uh, open it up to any questions you may have. There's a microphone uh, coming to you. Hey, hi Nick, question for you. You talked about uh, Cass. You're talking about above the line, below the line, or is that con combined in terms of the on talent? Line? Yeah, uh, it's, it's all talent, and it, even uh, on-air stunt people can go into that as well. On-air, meaning they have to be seen in the film, yeah. <laughs> and we'll make you prove it. Damn it! <laughs> that was his foot. A pro. Oh, sorry. In Iceland, you didn't mention uh, performers being uh, a tax credit. In front call. of camera talent? Yeah. Well, some of them had chosen to, to pay the taxes in Iceland, and, uh, and uh, some haven't. One of the reasons why I brought the minister to Hollywood to meet with the studios is to learn and how we can improve our system. And uh, hopefully, we'll. Jesus. 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 Yeah. yeah. They, 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 I mean, they do. We, we, you, we, you can do it if you like in Iceland. It's not mandatory. So some of the, direct, uh, of, of some of the actors have chosen to pay the taxes in Iceland. The tax for uh, a talent in Iceland is 32%. What's the tax for talent in, in New Mexico? New Mexico, uh, 2%. <laughs> <laughs> 4.9. 4.9, yeah, 4.9. 4.9. Okay. So Give that girl a t-shirt. We are, are working <laughs> on it as we speak, but hopefully. Yeah. You got it right. No t-shirt. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I just have, a, in terms of cultural uh, uh, comment, uh, are there any other tax incentives uh, in terms of Australia with the Aborigines or uh, Native Americans? Is there anything aside that is given to the groups? Not, not New promoted. Mexico. Not New Mexico. Australia has programs for the domestic industry in terms of um, investment and development, and there's, they have specific programs, depending on the state, um, for our Indigenous filmmakers, but that's very domestic focused. Yes, yes, question. I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. There, there are some territories that. Uh, don't have tax incentives because the productions don't pay taxes at all. So they have like, for example, the, v, the VAT, they don't pay it at front. The social taxes on the wages, they don't pay it. Just production just pay the flat rate and they don't pay taxes at all. So some countries go up to sometimes 47% not paying the taxes at front. So do producers like to have to pay taxes that they get reimbursement or prefer not to pay it at front? That's a question sometimes that uh, uh, producers uh, have to choose between that. 
I don't know. Does anyone have a feeling on that? We have a non-taxable transaction certificate that you can use, if, if I'm getting this right. But the t the you can't use it in conjunction with the incentive, with the incentive. so it's not worth it. Some of our states have payroll tax um, exemptions. So they're not. That's part of what that state offers. Um, but I'd imagine it's up to producers if they'd prefer which which way they'd go. What we see uh, sometimes is that you know people aren't paying income taxes. Forget about VAT. The you know if they contract through the loan out company, there's no in a state where there's no withholding tax on the payment made to the loan out company. They're not filing their income tax in that loan out in that state. We do, we withhold to, uh, for for <coughs> actors. We withhold at the highest rate, which is four point nine. Yeah. Thank you for the, uh, sharing your insights panel. Uh, you, the UK and New Mexico, I don't think we asked you about possible co-producers and investment producers in your territories and how we might be able to contact them through their services. Are you, do you have ways for us to match up with people we may not know in your area? Well, for New Mexico, we have a, uh, on our website, nmfilm.com, we have a list of crew that'll have producers and, uh, you know, has a whole list of crew. We have another uh, button that has vendors or services. And, and so you can go and look and, and find people uh, right there. So if you want a local producer or a line producer, that's where you'd go look. Yeah, and in terms of the UK, um, it really depends on kind of what type of producer you're looking for. We're handling more um, partnering with the production guild over there in terms of line producers and that type of thing. But if you're looking more for creative producers and or producers that might come in with some financing, um, another organization over there, the British Film Institute, which is much more involved in kind of funding and grants and that type of thing, they're actually kind of more suited, but we can make you know the appropriate introductions and that type of thing. Additionally, to the nations and regions, um, which can be really valuable um, because everybody just thinks of producers in and around London, whereas maybe it makes more sense for you to partner with someone out of Manchester and do your project up there. So um, in that case, I would put you in touch with Creative England, and they can you know, share with you, let's say, a list of you know, eight or ten producers that might be you know, a match. Yeah. I had a question for Katie. Y'all yeah. have some really beautiful historic sites, beautiful mm -hmm. castles. How mm -hmm. difficult is it to get permission from the, I suppose, the local film commissions to shoot there? Could you explain that process? Yeah. Um, you know, it really depends on the site that you're after. Um, some of the most famous ones, be it castles, what have you, or you know, Buckingham Palace, that type of thing, a little bit tougher. But there are a lot of places that double as Buckingham Palace. So there are ways to get around it. Um, usually, depending on whether it's in London or outside, can put you in touch with the local locations people. And or if it's a historic um, kind of national trust site, they actually handle all that themselves. But they're very easy to work with. So again, our office can put you in touch um, with them. But one of the things, the kind of the doubles for some of those places end up being, being key. Yeah. Tate, have time for one more question, and then we'll do a raffle. Yeah. OK, two more, her and her. Well, first of all, this is a thank you to Nick. I'm a tax accountant in Arizona. <laughs> so far, 102 men, local residents, have come in laid New Mexico driver's licenses on my desk and W-2s from the Mexico film companies because they've declared themselves they can't get work in Arizona, but you'll hire them. So thank you. Aww. Thank you, <laughs> Sure. What a You're welcome. <laughs> what a I, I, had a, I had a question for okay. Katie. Yeah. Um, are there other, it's like you, Australia and England will pair up if yeah. you want to shoot in multiple places, are there? I know you said like places in Europe. I think maybe or. Yep. Well, so the UK has. I think it's now eleven kind of as Kate was talking about official co-production treaties with other territories, be it South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Um, 
But what a lot of times we'll do instead of going the official treaty route is to do kind of a co-production a la co-venture where maybe you're doing a, a majority of your work in the UK but then you're going to do some work in Hungary or Iceland or Croatia or whatever it might be. Um, some, some territories work better with us than others in terms of being able to dip into incentives there and incentives in the UK. And so we can help you kind of understand based on previous experience of other people kind of what's worked and what's not and advise you appropriately. Yeah? Last question. Yeah, I have a question about diversity and especially in UK because that's where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And I know that, you know, in recent years, mm -hmm. there hasn't been a lot of diversity coming out of the UK, and I mm -hmm. want to know how that's doing. It's a good question, and I feel like I should probably get a bit more up on it myself. Um, I do know that uh, Creative Skill Set, which is the organization that is there in terms of training and improving crews and you know, reaching out and training people in the industry. They do have a diversity agenda and initiative, but I personally haven't seen studies kind of from this year to this year, but I'd be happy to look into it and, yeah, and because, let you know. You know, because, you know, there is such a diverse, you know, you have your no, Indian population, sure. you have Jamaican population, African population, and I know most of the TV shows that I've been watching on Netflix or whatever, yeah. um, it's not really reflecting that. Yeah. And so I'm wondering where that's standing. Yeah. But you're talking about across the whole production, yeah. so not just in, in front of the camera, yes. but you know, people working as gappers or craft service or what have you. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to look into it a bit for you and let you know. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we get the rest time for the raffle. If I didn't get a raffle ticket to you, if you have a business card, just go and pass it to the aisle or grab them. Make sure everyone's accounted for. Thank you. Well, Joe, where are you shooting your film? That's the big I question. Know. Everybody oh. wants to know. I got to go back and sharpen my pencil because I learned a lot here. and. Uh, no decisions yet. No decisions okay. yet. I'm not committing okay. just yet. I'm gonna we'll see check what... in at next year's AFCI, right? <laughs> Katie, I have a question for you. Yeah. The one in the, the photo is shown from Buckingham Palace. Was it shooting a film or was it one of the princes that was jumping out? Okay, get those in. Let's go.